Well, thank you for the invitation. It's quite an honor to be here. I think Christa Ehrlich would have been thrilled to know that she and her work would be discussed here today in this building she was quite familiar with. To let her be more present here, I am currently wearing one of her favorite shirts, made and worn by herself. My goal for today is to give you a glimpse into my research about the work and network of Christa Ehrlich, who in 1927 left Vienna to go and work as a designer in the Netherlands. For this, I will first introduce you, uh, I will first introduce her and her early Viennese work. I will then tell something about her emigration to the Netherlands and the design she produced there. And I'll end with briefly focusing on a few people from her network. For decades, she kept in touch with her Viennese friends and colleagues abroad, some of whom themselves pursued, pursued artistic careers in places like Berlin, Paris, and the United States. Let her show that even at great distances, these contacts remained valuable, both privately and professionally. But first, and Katrin already uh, told you something, um, I would like to tell you on how this story came to be. When, a couple of years ago, I became interested in Christa Ehrlich, the literature was quite limited. Luckily, the Dutch Institute for Art History had some material, as had some avid collectors. But everybody who was in the know told me that story is lost, because her complete household, including her paperwork, seems to have been put at the trash at her death in 1995. There were wild rumors of a bric-a-brac trader cycling past her house on trash day and taking some of the stuff he found on the pile, but of course not everything. And I was told that her diaries and an accompanying Hoffmann or Peche goblet were sold at a street market in The Hague. Nevertheless, I put out a search for her name in the Dutch eBay. Maybe I could find some of her designs. And in early 2020, this came up. It's Christa's membership card for the Kunstschau of 1928, which is also designed by her. Of course, I needed to have it, and I asked the seller, is there more? Well, she said, and a couple of months later, it was COVID lockdown time, she came by with bags full of letters, designs, photographs, and other documentation. She turned out to be Christa's hair, and since she did not have any particular interest in it, she kept these bags closed since 1995. You do something with this, she told me as she handed over the bags. And this is the reason I can tell you this story here today and illustrate it with so many pictures. <coughs> Christa was born in 1903, grew up in an upper middle class Catholic family in Vienna. Her father was the director of a firm in the automobile business. There were sailing holidays in Gmünden and skiing holidays in the Austrian Alps. Christa was a good student attended Real Gymnasium and thought she liked to become an analyst. But then she discovered the arts by seeing a show of Hoffman students. She was a volunteer with the Wiener Werkstätter for a year, and then she took her first class at the Kunstgewerbe Schule in 1920. She was, I think, the only person to become a regular student after volunteering in the Wiener Werkstätte. The next years, until 1924, she studied to become a Kunstgewerblerin. Her initial goal was to become a ceramicist, maybe under the influence of the female cer ceramicist, like Wieseltier. So she took up classes with Michael Povoni, but soon she became very interested in fashion and interior design. Her favorite classes were the Fachklasse für Architektur by Josef Hoffmann, which she attended for three years. She there made, I'm citing from her report card, Mode Entwürfe, Kleider für das Proletariat, Inszenierungen für Theater, Pölster Entwürfe, Wandmalereien, Tapeten, Druckte Stoffmuster, Stickereien, and a lot of other things. Hoffmann's verdict, Talentiert für Mode und Mode Details. He also called her Strebsam, voll Initiative und Fleiß. And indeed, Christa showed herself to be ambitious and diligent. And after her study, she made designs for textiles and wallpapers for the Wiener Werkstätte. In the Kunstschau of 1927, held in this very building, 
This was her room. Note the daring abstract wall and ceiling paintings, which resemble the design for the membership card I found. She was soon allowed to collaborate in Hoffmann's studio, also on major projects. For example, on Villa Knips, built for, an art, built for art patron Sonja Knips. I think you all know her 1898 project, a portrait by Gustav Klimt, which, in the picture in the lower right corner, hangs above the fireplace, Ehrlich designed. She was also commissioned to design some wallpapers and curtain fabrics, although not all of them, and the stucco decorations for this new house. That Hoffmann employed Ehrlich for this important commission speaks volumes about his appreciation for her. In 1925, the hugely important international exhibition of modern decorative and industrial arts took place in Paris, which was visited by 16 million people over six months of time and which took months to build. Austria took part with an infamously costly pavilion designed by Josef Hoffmann and others. The grand gallery of it, which you see here, <clears throat> where a lot of work of female and male designers and artists were dis was displayed, was decorated by Ehrlich, an enormous accomplishment for a woman barely 22 years old. Although she probably was aided by Camilla Bierke and Hilda, Hilda Polsterer, two classmates from the Kunstgewerbeschule, Christa is the only one who is credited with the work on the small plaque in the corner of the gallery. Here she is at work. As you can see, she wore a work suit, which consisted of a jacket and, lo and behold, Trousers. This may not strike us as odd now, but in Paris in 1925, a woman walking around in trousers was an absolute faux pas. Annelies Krekel, a Dutch researcher who knew Ehrlich personally, told me on how the directors of the exhibition sent a staff member to her, insisting that she might wear a skirt. Ehrlich then pointed to the ladder, which was nearby, and asked, so you want me to work on a ladder in a skirt? Finally, the pants were maintained. One cannot stretch enough how important it was for women to be able to participate in these grand ex exhibitions. And by participating, I do not only mean showing their work or seeing that of others, but also participating in the managing and building of the exhibition themselves. Especially during the building period, artists, decorators, and architects worked long days, and, the evening, and in the evening mixed in Paris bars. Traditionally, and still very much so in the 20s, this was a man's world. Being there meant having the opportunity to gain knowledge and to access a broad professional network. Ehrlich's address book of those years seemed to bear some traces from that period, with pages full of Parisian addresses. Like, uh, for example, uh, that one of Sonia Delaunay and the atelier of Le Corbusier et Jeanneret. Also, teams were built and made stronger. On the picture on the lower left, you see Ehrlich teaming up with Camilla Bierke and Hilde Polsterer. And in the upper right, these three, together with the Armenian Austrian architect Gabriel Guevrikian, Guevrikian, <laughs> who made a cubist garden for the pavilion take a trip from Paris to England. As is clear in the picture below it, by this time, Ehrlich was trusted and appreciated by Josef Hoffmann. They even dutzed each other. In 1927, two years after the Paris exhibition, there was another important applied art show, Europäisches Kunstgewerbe in Leipzig. Ehrlich became Bauleiterin, the site manager for the Austrian delegation. During the construction period, she met Karel Begeer, director of an important silver factory in the Netherlands, who was there for the Dutch delegation. Karel Begeer, a connoisseur of European applied arts, had been an admirer of jo Josef Hofmann for years, had visited the Paris exhibition in 1925, and had seen Christa's decoration in the Austrian pavilion. Actually, he even bought an object by Mitzi Friedman Otten out of these very displays. There seems to have been a lot of exchange and a true coup de foudre between them. And when after the opening, Karel returned to his wife and family, it was the beginning of an intimate postal exchange that I personally 
would never ever have had delivered at my work address, but Christa fearlessly had them sent to Studio Hoffmann at Stubenring 3. In one of those letters, Carol wrote her, Ich möchte dich wohl bei mir haben und zusammen arbeiten mit dir. Wäre das denkbar? Du müsstest aber Wien aufgeben und das wird dir zu schwer fallen. Well, it did not seem too difficult for Christa. Hoffmann did not like to see her go, but finally wrote a testimonial letter in which he praised, among other, other, other things, her significant talent, great skills and reliability. At the end of the summer of 1927, 24 years old, she took the train to the Netherlands to stay, to love and to pursue a new career as a designer for the big silver factory. At the time of Christa's arrival, the objects produced at the silver factory were largely old school, loosely based on classical styles with plenty of ornamentation. The year before, Karel Begeer ordered, an, ordered an, an enormous new German deep drawing press. It was a big investment in the company and was intended to make the production method of silver objects more efficient and the looks more modern. Some of her first designs in the Netherlands were directly based on the possibilities of this press. Like this revolutionary modular tea set in the picture below, in which she absolutely minimized the ornamentation. She designed a set of different silver cylinders, which could be combined with different, different sets of handles and knobs. By working as a designer for metal objects, and then also applying such sleek modern design, which was achieved with huge and powerful presses, she was definitely crossing boundaries into male territory. Other designs were clearly inspired by motives and forms she knew from Viennese designers. Sometimes the influence of, for example, designs from Hoffmann was very clear. In fact, the silver factory advertised her designs in newspapers while evoking her bohemian Viennese background and calling her not a designer, but an artist. It was, by the way, for Dutch factories, quite unusual to, adver to advertise products with the name of a designer, let alone the name of one of those very scarce woman designers. Also in her own appearance, she was not shy in showing she came from Vienna. In pictures I found in her albums, I could identify several of her pieces of clothing made from Wiener Werkstätte fabrics. Here, she's in Germany, around 1929, wearing a dress and a cape made from the fabric, fabric Kirschblüte, cherry blossoms, by Felice Rixueno. From this designer, she also possessed this little silver and enamel box, adorned with blossoms, pretty much matching the dress, and also designed by Rixueno. And this is her in Sweden in 1930, wearing an outfit made from Maria Liekhardt's Marguerite design. So being abroad, she seems to have cherished her Viennese identity in her appearance, but also in her designs. Naturally, the network that she maintained from the Netherlands also bears strong traces of her Viennese background. Tracing a historical network can be quite difficult. In Ehrlich's case, I was lucky, for I could make use of documents, especially an address book. Uh, an address book, fragments of preserved correspondence and diaries. Additionally, there were a lot of pictures that could sometimes be linked to those documents and sometimes seemed to have their own stories to tell. Then there are the scarce oral sources, stories that never have been written down. I encountered a few. And finally, I looked at Krista's professional activities to see who she must have met or known. On this basis, I think it's possible to get a pretty good idea of Ehrlich's main network. But for this talk, I had to keep it simple. I will sketch only the very general outlines of her network in the 20s and 30s, which was her most productive period, and I did not include her Dutch or Swedish contacts. Ties with Vienna remained strong in the early years. In 1928, The firm of Hoffmann gave her one more big assignment for the Kunstpalast Düsseldorf. But Oswald Herte, then assistant of Hoffmann, mixed things up and Likard Strauss ended up doing it. After this, the contact with the firm seems to be minimal, 
although contacts with Hoffmann himself would continue until well into the 1950s. Then she wrote a lot with her father, with whom she had a very close relationship. He wrote her very regularly about Viennese affairs. Also, she kept in touch with Austrian-Dutch childhood friend Julie Wachalowski, Wach who did not have a career in arts or crafts, but whose father was the owner of the Gmünna Ceramics. She occasionally also received visits from Vienna, like a bus full of architecture students from the school of Clemens Holzmeister and Max Fellere, with whom she was on friendly terms. She guided them through the architectural highlights of the Netherlands in 1931. Here are four of her most important close friends from Vienna, all active in the arts or crafts. Christa corresponded with them for years, up to, de up to decades after emigrating. These four have all some things in common. They all studied at the Kunstgewerbeschule uh, and they all continued their creative careers abroad. The correspondence has surf survived very fragmented. I know some of you have been working on research research concerning these people, so maybe together we can connect some dots. This is Lisa Fischer, also called Alice. She moved to Berlin, Paris, and finally to America, as being Jewish, to escape persecution by the Nazis. She made jewelry, prints, and more. In pictures, we see them hanging out together in Berlin, wearing ties, and in 1930, she sent Ehrlich this wonderful picture of her with the hat in a sewing atelier, which, after I've read Ashley Callahan's article on her, I think might be Raimann School in Berlin. Lise is the one with the hat. Then there was Paula Stout, née Weinbach. She married Wolfgang, the son of Josef Hoffmann. Together, they started their own design firm in America. Later on, she married writer Rex Stout and was very successful as a textile designer. What she and Lisa Fischer have in common is that both of their work sold to Hollywood couturier Gilbert, Gilbert Adrian, who used it in or on his designs. Then there's Hilde Polsterer, she stayed in Paris after the 1925 exhibition. And Ernst Schwadron, I could not find a right free portrait of him, uh, founded an architectural and interior design firm in Vienna. In the 30s, he moved to New York to escape the Nazi regime and continued his business. Ehrlich sent him dinner silver as a gift. And in 1949, he asked her to come to New York and work for his company which she didn't do. Each friendship presented its own dynamic and its own possibilities. But because of the limited time, it's only possible to zoom in on one of those friends to show what a Kunstgewerblerin Freundschaft could look like and what it had to bring to both of their budding careers. Hilda, or Hilde, Polsterer, she was already mentioned before, was a classmate and became a very good friend of Ehrlich. She worked on the decoration of the Austrian pavilion in the 1925 Paris exhibition and decided to stay there after having, been, after having been offered a creative job at the Printemps department store. She also did designing for Primavera, the artistic branch of the store. Meanwhile, she tried to make a name for herself as an artist with paintings and large figurative, figurative wall tapestries. Like Ehrlich, she had fallen in love with a married man in her case, the Dadaist Tristan Tsara, who lived in a house built by Adolf Loos on Montmartre. Generally speaking, while being in the Netherlands, the tidings Ehrlich got from Vienna were not that great. Money was always short, clients did not pay, people emigrated, artistically there seemed to be no growth. Vienna did not seem such an attra attractive place anymore. But when in 1930, things in the Netherlands did not go as planned for Ehrlich, and she suffered emotionally, she seriously considered moving back to Vienna. She wrote to Polsterer about it, who wrote back quickly. Ich habe genau dasselbe durchgemacht. 
Aber bevor ich den Wiener Gefriesern meine Leide zeige, hänge ich mich eher auf. Bleib in Holland vorläufig, es renkt sich alles ein mit der Zeit. Denk nur nicht an Wien. Wien ist verfault und ranzig. Und sei lustig, liebste Christa, man hat ja schließlich nur das Glück, dass man sich selber macht. Christa takes a long holiday in Sweden and decides not to go back to Vienna. Around that time, Polsterer makes some efforts to get Ehrlich to move to Paris. She arranges a letter of recommendation for her from the director of Primavera for the fashion designer Paul Poiret. She also asks if Ehrlich won't come to work for the tapestry artist Jean Lursat. He has a big job to do. The work is light and fun and there is a lot of dancing and eating and she already knows his brother, the architect André Lursat, from the exhibition in Paris. Christa does not move to Paris, although she seems interested in the job at Lursat. For her part, she shows that she already knows quite a bit about the way things are done in the Netherlands. In November 1930, she arranges for Hilda's tapestry to be published in the leading art magazine Op de Hoogte. This is the reaction of Hilde. Ich freue mich rasend, muss mich momentan sehr plagen, um Arbeit zu bekommen. Ich denke, dieses Haft wird etwas Schwung in meine Affäres bringen. Wirklich, Christa, ich bin ernstlich zu Tränen gerührt. These snippets of correspondence are an example of how women's networks could provide emotional and professional support over great distances and open up career <coughs> possibilities. In the letter of recommendation Hoffmann wrote after Ehrlich left for the Netherlands in 1927, he called her verlässlich, trustworthy, and that he was right in this was proven once again 20 years later, in the winter of 1946-47. It was the coldest winter in decades. Vienna groaned under the shortage of food and coal, 70% of the children were malnourished, and probably so were Josef Hoffmann, by now 76 years old, and his wife Carla. Their house had been bombed in an air raid. He had been living in a coal cellar for a while, and times had been harsh, after he had fallen out of grace due to his conduct in the war. Ehrlich has heard of, had heard of the suffering in, the, in her natal city, must have been worried about her old professor. In 1947, she sent Hoffmann some packages with luxury foods, like raisins and chocolates, and items like a pair of socks, which were greeted with great enthusiasm. At receiving her first package, Hoffmann writes, Deine Sendung ist gerade angekommen, als wir außer schwarzen Bohnen und Brot nichts mehr Essbares zu sehen bekamen. And Carla writes, Die Schokoladen hat Professor gleich in Beschlag genommen. Sie wissen ja, dass er Süßigkeiten über alles liebt. These packages revived the contact, contact and led to an annual Christmas card to Holland until Hoffmann's death. Some of them in a form you might expect to see, like this one, and some might be a bit surprising. In this symposium, we're discussing women who took up their business and moved away, considering all the artists and designers that have built their lives elsewhere or have lost their lives in the war. What does the other side look like? What's left of Vienna after the war? And what's the perspective of the person that stayed? Who could answer that better than Hoffmann himself in a letter to Ehrlich? Unser ganzer Kreis ist ziemlich auseinandergerissen, in der ganzen Welt zerstreut und manchmal lädt man schon unter durchwegs fremden Menschen. Looking back on her early career in the past 20 minutes, it may give the impression of a smooth ride, but looking closer, we see Ehrlich, trans we see Ehrlich transgressing different gender boundaries. Boundaries as small as wearing trousers at work or as big as claiming her space as a female designer in a foreign country. Being just 22, but being responsible for an important part of her country's pavilion in the Paris exhibition. Working as a woman with metal in a factory, not as a polisher, but as a designer, and not staying in anonymity, but having her name advertised next to her designs. And in this adventure, being supported by her friends and acquaintances, spreading out a safety net of possible alternatives, be it in Paris or New York, which she never had to make use of. <laughs>